Hey guys, my name is Sarah Coates, the voice of Marguerite Baker in Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, and you are listening to Crimson Head Elder Podcast. Want to come to dinner? Can you see that area behind me beneath the red tinted sky? That is what's left of Raccoon City. Our platoon is cut off. Survivor stuff. I'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters. We're both gonna die. Wait, don't shoot! Get down! I lost all my men because of her. All is lost. Cries of agony. Unity breeds power. Welcome to the Crimson Head Elder Podcast, your favorite podcast about your favorite video game. We're the number one survival horror podcast on iTunes, and here's why. Good evening and happy Halloween from all the Crimson Head Elder team, but tonight you're joined by myself, George Trevor, and the Oracle Dragon, as we put questions from you, the survival horror community, to tonight's special guests, stars of Resident Evil Code Veronica. She brought to life antagonist royalty with Alexia Ashford, and joins us for the second time. Leela Johnson, welcome to the Crimson Head Elder podcast. Hi, 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 hello. So nice to hear you guys. And also joining us for the second time, the one and the only actor for Claire Redfield, Alison Court. It's great to have you. How are you this Halloween evening? I'm great, thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us, Alison, and of course, Leela, for making this a very special Halloween evening for the whole survival horror community. Now, joining me to ask the questions we've got from the website, Aaron, the Oracle Dragon. Hello. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Morning. Hope everybody's doing good. <laughs> yes, thank you. This Halloween evening's podcast, along with all of our podcasts, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. That's Resident Evil Podcasts. And also at the website, www.crimson-head.com. That's crimson-head.com. You can also follow us at Twitter for all the latest survival horror news. And that's at crimson underscore head. And now, without further ado, on to your questions. So we've got Sarah L.Y., who I have to say is one of the most passionate Code Veronica fans in the community. She's examined and written about the character of Alexia with uh, an appreciation that's inspiring. Sarah highlights both Claire and Alexia's qualities of confidence, unapologetic power leading, traits rarely seen for female characters in popular culture when compared to their male counterparts. By comparison, Hollywood films like Mad Max and Wonder Woman are shifting towards powerful, strong, badass female leads. We even have females now being cast in previously male chosen characters such as Doctor Who and the Ghostbusters film. Does the mainstream finally get it, or is it just a trend, or even maybe an answer to Donald Trump's misogynist agenda? <laughs> Such a great question. I love this question. Um, yes, I think getting it is happening. I like to look for the evidence of things I believe in, and uh, there was undoubtedly a real shift with the Women's March. I marched in Manhattan, and it was truly a celebration of badass leading women. <laughs> Trump, you know, is, is a bully, the dirty underbully that's in desperate need of being cleaned up. But what I see is happening is definitely a shift into greater clarity, and entertainment has the power to reflect that clarity, and I see more and more of it. Yeah, I think while I love, I love this strength with, both Claire and Alexia, I still think there was so much more that could have been explored within Code Veronica. If you look at that moment after Alexia does her big spiel and Claire's standing there and Claire's about to, to sort of confront Alexia and speak her mind and then the boys jump in and kind of it becomes this giant sausage fest again. Claire never actually had an opportunity to say what she thought in that moment. And 
unfortunately, a lot of Code Veronica is that way. There isn't a lot of great dialogue exchange from Claire with the main baddies. And as much as it, we know that's in her character, I don't think there were as many opportunities for her to, her to actually express it. I think Alexia is fantastic, but again, she sort of, the real Alexia is kind of kept in a coma for, for most of the game, and we don't really get to see her true power until uh, Alfred is gone, and the real Alexia kind of comes out of her shell. Even with Alexia, as strong as she is, they don't know how to write a female character who has layers, who, who is both strong and yet compassionate or vulnerable, uh, depending on the moment. So I think what's great with what's coming out of Hollywood now and, and independent films, certainly North America, is that we are now allowing female characters to be strong, but also still to have a feminine side. A lot of times in video games, when they write strong female characters, suddenly they're basically like writing male characters, just sticking them in female bodies. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that is such a good point. I so agree with you, Allison. I love how you said that. That's, a, you know, exactly it. I think that's, I think you hit the nail on the head. These strong female characters, it was just going forward as men or with the, with the masculine. But now it's like these strong feminine characters are leading with the feminine. You're absolutely right. It's great to see. It's something that I would like to see developed more in video games. I think it's why Claire originally resonated with fans so much because mm. she wasn't just like this star's officer that was all military toe the line like her male counterparts. She had this other realistic feminine side. And hopefully they continue to allow that to shine in whatever iterations come out. I wish we could have seen more of Alexia, to be honest. Also, because the character, particularly with Claire, is so well-rounded, it's very easy as a male gamer. You can throw yourself into the character and you're kind of, you're not, you're not aware in a gender specific way that may serve as a barrier to kind of connect with the character. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that that's the case. I think everyone, real human beings have layers. We all have, it's not a male or female thing. We all have the ability for compassion and empathy in moments of difficulty that fight or flight instinct will also kick in look at women protecting their children they might be the tiniest most fragile looking creatures on the earth but you threaten a woman's child and she will take you down every time. <laughs> <laughs> so i think we still have a long way to go in terms of how our characters are represented or how women are portrayed on screen but this summer has been incredibly refreshing i hope it's not just the current trend I'd like to see it continue. I love that Wonder Woman set records at the box office. And let's just keep it going. And I think for a show which I think has a lot, a lot of faults, actually, The Walking Dead does strong female aids pretty well and in very different ways and not in stereotypical ways with someone like Michonne. And then you've got Carol. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Whoa! Wait, wait. Don't shoot. Who are you? Wait right there. I'm coming over. Uh, sorry about that little misunderstanding, but I thought you were another one of those mon- Shut up! Make one wrong move and I'll shoot! My name's Steve. I was a prisoner on this island, and I'm guessing you're not from Umbrella either. No, I'm Claire. Claire Redfield. Claire? Next question hmm. comes from Resi Evil Chick 99 to Leela. She asks, how does it feel to have voiced Capcom's first iconic female villain? nothing but a, a great privilege. It was extraordinary to create the voice as it was my first voice gig. It was, uh, and it continues to be, um, one of the greatest highlights of, of my career. The, uh, you know, all the Resident Evil fans, the storyline, the, the layers as Allison says around the character. It was nothing but a, an extraordinary privilege. Claire Redfield, hold it right there. We meet each other at last. A pity I must say goodbye so soon. I am Alexia Ashford. For the pride of the Ashford family, I will kill you. Nemesis asks to Allison, the Claire Redfield character has been portrayed by far less actors than most, than most of the other characters in the series. Do you feel that this is a good thing? And if so, why? Well, personally for me, because it meant I got to be involved <laughs> and play her. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was a good thing. I guess 
from a personal aspect, but as well as fans who were watching the journey of the character because we were allowed to watch her grow and evolve. And you really get to see the culmination of that in the Degeneration movie. But I also, I also think that when you're in a different medium, like in the movies, and you've got Ali Larder playing Claire, that's great too. Because I'm a huge Ali Larder fan. I thought she looked wicked cool on, on screen. And she's strong and she's badass. I'm, I'm happy with the different iteration. Redfield! How dare you interfere with my operation? What are you talking about? You let yourself be captured so you could lead your people to this base. I have no idea what you're babbling about. You don't fool me. I am Alfred Ashford, commander of this base. Oh? You must be one of Umbrella's lower level officers if you're in command of a backwater base like this one. How dare you? Nemesis asked Alila, which female tragic figure from the past, fiction, or non-fiction do you feel most captures the spirit of Alexia? I would say, hands down, the great dame and powerful presence of Lady Macbeth. She is the iconic conflict figure between the feminine and the masculine. She re really, uh, you know, she trades in her instincts towards compassion and fragility for the single-minded pursuit of power. I would definitely say that um, she carries a lot of Alexis' spirit. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Alexia. That is how I dispose of insignificant bugs, said the spider to the fly. How do you wish to die? <laughs> Gina asks, what aspects or elements of the story of Code Veronica did you like the most and why? That's actually a really, really good question. I love the weird stuff. I love that it takes us on a journey that we're not expecting because for, for so much of it, it is very much its own separate entity out of the, what's been established as the Resident Evil world. We're not in Raccoon City. And you've got some really weird stuff going on. <laughs> it's very uh, left field. Yeah. The relationship between Alfred and Alexia is wonderful because, again, you can't really anticipate what's going to happen. Be focused, brother. Our enemy is only a little girl. Oh, why is this taking so long? My apologies, Alexia, but I have been doing my best. The revival of the Ashford family depends on your success, brother. I am aware of that, Alexia. I will revive the family name myself and make you the master of the glorious Ashford family. Do not worry, brother. I will handle them both myself. Who is there? Is someone at the corridor? The room with the carousel, like just all of the freaks. Yes. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, I love that scene and with the music. That scene really stands out with Wesker, even though Wesker basically beats the crap out of Claire. Um, <laughs> which isn't really how I would like the no. altercation to go. But she does stand up to him a little bit. She does. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would have liked to see I guess that's what I'm missing. I feel that things were left unfinished between the two of them. Yeah. And we never got to see what would happen if they had a confrontation later on. I would love to see that continue as, as a story. Yeah, any chance to do stuff between Claire and Wesker, I'm a fan of. So I was really happy when, when we got to do that scene for Club Veronica X. And, of course, the opening. That I love the opening. It just launches you into the game. Well, first off, we were way before Paul Anderson got his paws on movies. So, hello. <laughs> he might have a Code Veronica feel with his movies, but not the other way around. I would say the opening was much more our inspiration would have been John Woo. I felt like such a badass. Because, of course, when we first recorded the game, there were no visuals to go with it. And then it was half a year later, we got to do some pickups to the video. And seeing that beginning was just, I got goosebumps because it was so exciting. And I yeah. felt very, very cool. 
it would have felt out of context if we had been shown the same Claire from the very first days of Raccoon City. She's moved on and I think it's a great way to introduce the fact that she has moved on and, and can thereby cope with the trials of Code Veronica. It's what happens when you put a pair of jeans on. That's all I can <laughs> <laughs> You put jeans on and suddenly you're like double fisting the pistols and, and flying through the air. Yeah, no, I think it totally makes sense with what her character has been through. Yeah. She just survived a zombie apocalypse hanging out with a cop. And she's the little sister of a stars guy. It totally makes sense as far as I'm concerned. She's young, she's athletic, she's smart. So she also would have known to hone her skills because she knew what was coming. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very fitting. How does each actress feel that their characters improves the Code Veronica narrative? How does the character improve the story? Well, I would say Alexa adds the spice and the heat. Yes, good answer, yes. She's the shadow of the feminine archetype. Yeah, she brings forward the, the spice and the heat. <laughs> At last, I've found you, Alexia. Come with me. <laughs> You're responsible for the creation of the T. Veronica virus. And now the only existing sample is in your body. I want it. Now! You want it? You are not worthy of its power! <laughs> that laugh, that laugh. That laugh was well intended for her. I put my heart into that. I wanted that laugh to be as if life was being drawn out of her and a place for her pain to play out to be known. <laughs> it's Alexia! Alexia? There really is an Alexia? <laughs> it is almost time, you genetically inferior siblings. <laughs> After her, she might know where Steve is. Let's go. And I think Alexia also really ties it back into some of the, the true fundamental Resident Evil themes with the T-Virus, because a lot of Code Veronica is dealing with Alfred, who is just, um, pardon my French, but batshit crazy. And <laughs> so... For a while, you're kind of in this other world. Yes, there are zombies, but there's this other layer which is very, very different from the other Resident Evil games. So having Alexia actually represent that pure source of the virus and tying that back in and also thereby introducing Wesker's reason for coming back into the game besides his desire to kill Chris. Alexia really is pinnacle to completing the, the story to keep it within the Resident Evil world and allow the story to continue past Code Veronica, where that ends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As for Claire's involvement, yeah. Claire is more of the... She represents the player, the audience. She's there to, to let the game be seen through her eyes. But she's more, re in this game, she's really reacting more than causing things to happen, I think. I think it's much more about the, the other characters, Steve, Alfred, Alexia, and Wesker, that really are the ones that are pinnacle to this story. Steve? Oh, Claire. <laughs> Oh, I can't do it! Who did this to you? That crazy woman told me she was going to perform the same experiment on me that she did on her own father. She's completely insane! What's wrong? Claire! Now this is a very long one, and it's all directed to you, Leela. And it comes from J.C. Wesker. He says, Leela, 
Alexia is one of the best villains in the series, and one of the very few who totally kicked Wesker's butt. <laughs> <laughs> you are able to invoke such fear and dread with a voice that is both hauntingly calm and yet also pure malice. A cocktail of evil that surely puts Alexia in the pantheon of villains, both within Resident Evil series and beyond it. To quote Ash from the film Alien, I'm clouded by conscience, remorse, or delusions of morality. Yet, she does show signs of feelings toward her brother. But, do you personally think that Alfred was one of the persons Alexia may have cared about, or was he merely another worker ant who served his purpose? I love this question. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> um, you know, she is a, a tragic figure because uh, she is actually a, a victim of her circumstance. Yeah, I most certainly believe she cared for her brother. If I may quote from actually one of my favorite short stories from Cortis Island, and one character turns to the other character and says, did you ever think that life could go like that and end up like this? Well, it can I liken that to the relationship between those two, between the brother and the sister. Did you ever think life could go like that and end up like this? Well, it can. <laughs> this game is not over yet. Now you will see what real terror is all about. <laughs> Another question from JC Wesker. Allison, your portrayal of Claire has always been the true hallmark of the series in that it is the purity, depth, strength and humor of Claire's character which is not only why I believe Claire is such a beloved character but also why people all over the world truly resonate so much with your performance. It's why taking a journey through Code Veronica is as enjoyable in 2017 as it was almost 20 years ago. Alison, your character has limited screen time with Alexia and as two strong female leads would you have liked to have shared more interactions between the two of you? Absolutely. This is a great question, and I, this is the one that I thought we sort of touched on earlier. But, yeah, I remember being there back in 1999, and I remember <laughs> uh, we actually were in the booth briefly together, but we didn't have that much time. And I even think there was some interaction that ended up getting cut from the game. Just, you know, things don't fit here and there, one or two lines, but not that mm. much. I wish Chris hadn't burst in to that scene. I wish that Claire and Alexia could have had more of a dialogue exchange and confrontation because they both have brothers. They both have, yeah, like that is the underpinning for their characters and so much of what they do. So it would have been a fantastic confrontation to discuss that entire situation. And who knows, maybe even team up against Wesker or something <laughs> like there, there's so much that could have happened yeah. there. Yeah. Plus Chris is looking after for Claire and, Alfred's doing the sex thing for Alexia. Exactly. So how can you really, how can you judge, right? Um, I think there, there's a lot that they would have found common ground on. I mean, ultimately, Alexia really needed to die, but <laughs> 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 oh, they, they could have developed some friendship a little bit or something a little bit deeper than how it went. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> Gerald Durden asks to you, Allison, what is your opinion about the personality and evolution of the character Claire in Code Veronica and what distinguishes the Claire from Code Veronica to the Claire of Resident Evil 2? She obviously has been through more by the time we get to Code Veronica, so she's ready to hit the ground running. She's got more authority. She's ready to see someone young and naive like Steve and basically be like, okay, you need to shut up, just listen to what I'm saying and do what I do. But... She still has the compassionate side, which we got to know and love in Resident Evil 2. I think she was shortchanged in terms of being able to express some of the personality traits that we really like about Claire. With Code Veronica, I, I love the game, and it's, it's, I, I'm really conflicted with this because I think it's arguably the best game in the franchise for if you like more of the survival horror versus yes yeah what? well i'm always very much championing that side of it and i think it was one of the very last gen until you know maybe arguably resident evil 7 one of the last true survival horror games in the series yeah but that said i think she's still like the the involvement is there 
but her her chance to actually express some of that wasn't necessarily as fulfilling as it could have been. Final question from Gerald Durden, and I have to say he's a, he's a fantastic fan of the game because I actually discovered through him asking these questions that he has his own website dedicated to the Code Veronica game. Fans of the game can check that out in Gerald's question. He's got a link to his website, and it's full of fantastic Code Veronica information. And he asks, and we kind of touched upon it before, what, Leela, is your opinion about the relationship between Alfred and Alexia? You know, I actually, I, I do love this question. I know we did touch upon this earlier, uh, a, a little bit of the relationship, but I really feel like I could go on and on about those two. And um, did you know sand sharks eat their siblings in utero? In nature, you see this um, rivalry between brother and sister so dramatically that scientists actually call it the Cain and Abel syndrome. And I, you know, I personally have such a complicated relationship with my brother. So, again, I could really go on for hours and hours about these two. Really, truly, their dynamic is, is historic, is, is seen throughout nature. It's, it's just so classic. It's so complicated. It is the Cain and Abel syndrome. Who's going to survive the push out of the nest? But I think it always comes across that Alexia is the more powerful of the two and was always the more talented of the two. But you never kind of see that friction develop as, as a relationship. Alfred's always very much looking up to Alexia and, and there, there's never that friction at all so, or, or rivalry between them. And rivalry with feelings. She does hold her brother. She does care. Yeah. He really, really cared for her so far as to protect her all the way to the end. I think the, the Lannisters, Jamie and Cersei Lannister, have almost incorporated an Alfred Alexia dynamic. Wow, yeah. Well, I can really see where you're going with that. That's amazing. Mm. So Glitch asks you, Leela, is there a particular person you channeled from your life or from other media when playing Alexia? <laughs> uh, my own dark side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely my, uh, let's say my own personal shadows. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I'll take full credit for that. <laughs> oh, well, wonderful answer. <laughs> <sighs> We're safe now. Think again, Claire. I shall enjoy watching you shriek in agony. Not this time! You again! B.S.A. Arclay, on the staff team at Crimson Head Elder, he asks you, Alison, you recorded for both the original Code Veronica and the reimagining in the Dark Side Chronicles. Did you notice any differences, whether it be plot, character development, or even the attitude Capcom took toward the two projects? This is a tricky one for me to answer, because it was because Code Veronica and RE2 were kind of mushed together into Dark Side Chronicles, it was tricky to sort of separate on during the recording. There was a bit of crossover, so some of it was tricky to separate in terms of where we were in the story. You know, when you're running and screaming from zombies, it's hard to <laughs> Like zombies, raccoon city zombies, or island zombies. Like <laughs> from that standpoint, it was a little tricky. But I will say, also because it was a different kind of game engine, you know, Dark Side Chronicles being a on the rails game. Yeah, far less narrative plot for you as an as an actor to realize the character and get your teeth into. Right, but there was a bit of a trade off because I do I prefer the slow um, explore at your own peril survival horror games, but. With the Dark Side Chronicles, it was really just go, go, go from the moment the game starts until it ends. It was just action-packed, not no time to take a breath, go, 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 very intense. And that was fun to perform, too. I, I can tell you, like, it was exhausting, but it was really exciting. And they really wanted a, a more intimate and intense kind of performance at times. I appreciated being given a chance to play the same scenes, but take a different approach. I think that as an actor, I enjoyed that very much. Steve! Hold on. We're gonna get you out of here. No. I'm not gonna make it. You know that. The virus is in me. There's no turning back. No. You're coming with us. Claire. Steve? 
Steve! No! Stay here. I'm gonna go plant this in the power room. I'm coming with you. It's time this ended. Alexia has to be stopped. I'm gonna finish this, Steve. And then we'll all be free. BSA Arclay asks you, Leela, not having a mother and being raised in the manner they were, do you think the Ashford twins ever had a chance of leading normal lives? Like Albert Wesker and more recently Evelyn in Resident Evil 7, their fate seemed destined from their birth. Yeah, you know, although fate must unwind as it, as it must, it does seem like, you know, if they just had a little more nurturing, one little other factor in, in their upbringing definitely feels like a different outcome could have happened. Allison, is there anything you, you can speak to that? Um, I'm not sure that fate is the right word. I think you can blame parents and upbringing for a lot. And then, you know, at some point, we do hold others accountable for their own actions, right, in regular life. So at some point, you make a choice to double down on the crazy or <laughs> be better alive. Um, Alexia probably, I mean, she didn't really have a choice what was done to her. So, I mean, it, it's hard to say, but uh, there's got to be some personal accountability in there somewhere. The year is 1983, and I am afraid that my only daughter has become obsessed with the Veronica virus. She has even gone to the point of experimenting on her own body. Keep getting someone trying to join this call from Facebook. I wonder who it could be. Hold on, maybe we better let them say hello. Just think of me as a ghost from the past. Albert Wesker. Uh-oh. We're in trouble, folks. <gasps> my name is Richard Waugh. Oh, my God. I am, in fact, a ghost from the past. Oh, my Many, many years past. <laughs> hello, all. Mr. Waugh, I thank you so much for joining us. Wow, I don't know what to say. I mean, only on Halloween, the voice of Albert Wesker. <laughs> for once, I'm speechless. <laughs> if you had heard me, I kind of made a little <gasps> sound where I was muted. And I cut you off the f I just cut you off the first time because I thought it was like a, a spam thing. I'm, I'll never live that down. <laughs> <laughs> Literally green with envy, weren't you? Those are all the quotes I could remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Richard, for um, surprising the pants off of Paul and Aaron. <laughs> Nothing cuts through quite like that voice. That'll send mm. chills down anybody's spine. <laughs> Aaron, you're speechless, aren't you? So many questions. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. Greetings. You must be the lovely Claire Redfield. Who are you? Let's just say that I'm a ghost coming back to haunt your dear brother. Whisker? It seems there's not much explaining to do, is there? I was the one who attacked this island. Who'd have thought you'd be hanging about? <laughs> All the better for me. Now that the cat dragged in this nice surprise, your ever so caring brother will definitely show up. I must thank you for being such good bait. I don't know what went on between you two, but you have them all wrong. My brother is not the kind of person you think he is. I despise Chris. Uh, what are you going to do to him? Oh, how your brother will weep to see you die. <laughs> what? What is it? Stay there. I'm coming. It appears you may be of some further use to me. I'm going to let you live a little longer. Alison, I can't thank you enough. And Richard, of course, thank you so very much. <laughs> <laughs> and apologies for cutting you off the first time. <laughs> I, to have the Albert Wesker gate crash is, is incredible. Thank you. <laughs> it's just another creepy guy from Canada. <laughs> um, you came in with style. Don't worry about that. 
Oh, he always comes in with style. He's Mr. Suave. And <laughs> Richard, with you and DC being friends, you're you're saying that there actually is a chance for a Claire sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I wish I, think, I could get on. I think, <laughs> I think that's for another podcast. This is a Halloween podcast. <laughs> yeah, that'll be Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Leela and I also appeared in a show which started with Codename. The other one was Eternity. It was Codename Veronica and Codename Eternity. We only do shows together that have Codename as the start. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we roll. Well, I'd love to work with her, but your title doesn't start with code name, so no. <laughs> and thank you for calling me the voice. I'm going to uh, text DC soon and tell him you said that. <laughs> very, I'll be very diplomatic, but for me personally, when Albert Wesker was portrayed, I believe, by Peter Jessup, and again, very much so by yourself, it was less histrionics. Albert Wesker wasn't human with your portrayal, even less human in Resident Evil 5 that's befitting of the delivery becomes almost more superhero. Yeah, yeah. Very much the, the direction that Capcom wanted to go with the character. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think DC just sort of made it his own. I mean, he, he admits himself he had to listen to me for a while <laughs> to get into the character. And now I listen to him when I'm trying to remind myself what this guy sounded like. Yeah, because a lot of people say DC is the anger Wesker has, and you are the voice of Wesker being the calm and yet I have a mission to do voice. Right, right, yeah. Well, I wanted to make him smooth. I wanted to make him calm. I find that more intimidating. Alexia? No. She's already fully awake. Chris, oh little fishy, come see my hook. Chris, I'm sending some company to keep you entertained. Consider this a small welcoming gift from me. Enjoy! <laughs> when we recorded Code Veronica, it wasn't until we went back and it was like six or eight months later and we were doing something for, I guess it was Code Veronica X, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so they did that whole expanded scene. And that was the first time that I actually got to hear Richard as Wesker. And I remember our voice director, Susan Hart, saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, he is so amazing, this voice. <laughs> like, getting to, to do some lines and listening to his voice was amazing. It is that smooth but sinister there was almost a Julian Sands approach, like if Julian Sands had a deeper voice, it was just super sexy and scary. <laughs> stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. I'm sorry, Richard, I'm not going to agree with the super sexy bit, but I do agree with what you said earlier as well, that it was very controlled. And the Oracle Dragon, Aaron mentioned this as well, that it's almost more sinister, more insidious tone to it. You sound like you're completely in control. Well, he seemed to be. And he stopped being human, right? So <laughs> Wesker wasn't human anymore. So I wanted to be, I wanted to, to give the feel of something superhuman, something completely that everything around him are merely ants. <laughs> Long time no see, Chris. Wesker? He's still alive? <laughs> what are you doing here? I came for Alexia. An organization hired me to capture her. Wait! You attacked the island! And my sister! <laughs> you have no idea how much I hate you. You destroyed my plans, so now I've sold my soul to a new organization. Now, die. Here's a little secret, Chris. I figured out that your sister is now in the Antarctic, with Alexia. It's too bad you won't be seeing her again. <laughs> <laughs> Alexia? 
<laughs> and such power in your delivery in the end scene when he's having that epic battle with Chris. Yeah, his obsession with Chris is really odd to me, but <laughs> I'm obsessed with Claire just because of Allison. I don't understand the obsession with Chris, though. <laughs> I think Wesker's infatuation with Claire is that he really likes her. Yes, absolutely. I think he's in love with her. That's what I decided. Mostly. What I decided, too. I am so good to go with this fan fiction. It's sort of like a Hannibal <laughs> Lecter, Clarice Starling yeah. pairing. Yeah, no, I always wanted to explore that aspect. But then I guess with what they did with the Wesker character, it went in a very different direction. But I'm just saying, there could be some fan spin-off. <laughs> <laughs> We'd both obviously like to see you both back, because I'm sure at some point in the future there's going to be an HD remaster. We had the one on the Xbox 360 and the PS3, but it's not on current generation consoles, and we'd love to see that. I would love to revisit Wesker, but then DC and I'd start fighting again. <laughs> <laughs> Chris! <sighs> Well done, Chris. It turns out that Alexia's work wasn't much of anything. So now, the only thing left is revenge. Let her go, Wesker! You don't want her! Fine. Claire! Today's a good day. I came for Alexia, but killing you is even better. Sorry to disappoint you. But Alexi is gone. We've been very lucky enough to have Peter Jessup on with us. And yeah, yeah, he joins Joe White and Peter Jessup and Ed Smarron, Chris Redfield, Barry Burton, and, and of course, Albert Wesker from the remake version of Resident Evil all came on one podcast with us. And what's interesting to me is there's, there's similarities for me in both your deliveries in that kind of cool, almost English, slight sounding cadence. Somewhere mid-Atlantic. Well, I'm somewhere mid-Atlantic. I won't profess to them. <laughs> I was interested what your thoughts were of Peter Jessup's delivery of Albert Wesker. I have not heard enough to say one way or another, but I did, I did notice that it seems to me that Peter and I are closer than I and DC are, but there is like a, there's a connection. There's almost a through line between the three of us, so which I, I think it would be very funny to have you know, the three of us sitting beside each other. A late name for a bad guy, though, eh? Albert. <laughs> Hi, my name's Albert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's kind of where it all started, because you maybe had, like, small man syndrome, but more sort of small name syndrome. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. In but it's a very English-sounding name, isn't it? So English name syndrome. Um... <laughs> my name is Albert Wesker. I aspired to become a leading researcher at Umbrella Inc., a pharmaceutical enterprise who covertly conducted bioorganic weapons, better known as BOW, for development. But at the leader development training ground situated in Raccoon City, I met a brilliant and talented researcher who made me decide to take a different path. William Birkin. If the old conspiracy against Dr. Marcus is revealed, Mr. Spencer's career will be over. Not to mention ours, too. So, the time has come at last. What are you going to do? I will simply say goodbye to Umbrella. The biological weapon utilizing the T-Virus has almost been completed. Our only remaining task is to acquire combat data. You can't be serious. I refuse to abandon my work. I have finished the research on the T-Virus, but I need a little more time to complete the more powerful G-Virus. Do as you wish. I will follow my initial plan and lure the STARS members into the mansion. Their superior combat training should make them perfect test subjects. <laughs> Anonymous fan. Yeah, very, mis <laughs> very mysterious. We don't know who he is or where he came from. All he knows is that he loves Code Veronica. He says, Leela, you gave an awesome performance as Alexia, but with limited screen time for your character, this distracted from what could have been a mind-blowing performance. I wish Capcom had given you the opportunity to bring that oomph to the game. Alexia is pretty tragic, too smart as a child and isolated from her age group. I think she was more confused and bitter than crazy. I think she had a better chance than Alfred at surviving the real world. Alfred was a sociopath, but Alexia was just angry, and anger doesn't last forever. A man after my own heart. <laughs> what sweet sentiments and great questions. I, I, I think uh, the heart of it is right here. I think she was more confused and bitter than crazy. 
is exactly what I agree with. And yes, and anger doesn't last forever. It's just a stepping stone. However, with that being said, I don't think she could have survived or adjusted to a normal life. I think she had gone off the tipping point. Waking up and seeing your brother die in front of you is a tipping point, too. Mm-hmm. She's such an extremely strong character, but all around her is, is, is a lot of tragedy. Yeah, again, she was, you know, I feel, I feel that she was a victim of circumstance. That's what makes her tragic. I will not allow you fools to escape. This is what you get for trying to oppose me. Now feel my revenge. <laughs> now, you must forgive me, Leela and Alison. Would it be okay, whilst we do have the voice of Albert Wesker with us, uh, to ask Mr. War a couple of questions about playing this iconic antagonist on multiple occasions, not just for Code Veronica X, but for both Resident Evil Zero and Resident Evil 4, and again returning to the role to narrate the considerably lengthy Wesker's report. I'm absolutely happy to listen to him talk, though, just so you know. I'm sitting here with a giant smile on my face. <laughs> so am I. I'm so am I. Smiling too. I was going to come in, say I'm a ghost from the past, and leave. Oh, no. <laughs> if at any point you want to kick me to the curb, that's fine. We won't do that. You're staying at the mansion forever. <laughs> I'll ask just one quick question to cover those multiple role reprisals as Albert Wesker. As I mentioned, not just for our Halloween showcase game Code Veronica, but also for the wonderful Resident Evil Zero, Resident Evil 4, and the legendary 5th anniversary DVD Wesker's Report. Richard, you have a huge wealth of highly praised television and film credits to your resume. Did you feel at the time of those various role reprisals that your performance was somewhat restricted by not being afforded the depth of character the biography you have enjoyed on those productions outside of the video game genre? I kind of like the freedom of not having too much information. It, it allowed me to, to create. When I first presented, and I think I've said this before, I think I said this at a convention, I was going with Shere Khan from Jungle Book, or, and, and I think I said a kind of Bowie from Labyrinth thing as a side thing, and then suddenly it became well, he's doing David Bowie. Well, I sound nothing like David Bowie. I wasn't doing David Bowie. Uh, I was doing George Sanders. And, and it was, to me, a risk when I first presented it to Susan. It was just me taking a shot at ultimate evil. All I knew was the name of the guy, that the thing was called Resident Evil or Biohazard in Japan. That's all I knew. So there was a freedom to that. And I took my shot, and Susan and the people from Capcom liked it. And it went from there. Does that answer the question or was that a rant? Wow. I almost <laughs> lost you at sheer calm. As a fan, you don't see these things. And then the artist references them. And I just can completely see that. Oh, it totally. Like, you're, you're blowing my mind here. Because when it makes so much sense, like, I get, I get the dynamic even more so with, with the labyrinth comparison. Um, not so much the voice, because you're right. You don't end up sounding like Bowie. But that dynamic between Claire and Wesker, it has several aspects of, you know, the playful where he's just sort of teasing her, oh, you silly little girl. And she's kind of this plaything that he's intrigued by. That makes so much sense. And the Cher Khan thing, when you first said that, it was instantly like, that's brilliant. And also now I want to hear you play Cher Khan. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> The freak murder incident that occurred in a forest near the mansion started it all. The mansion was Umbrella's secret bow laboratory, and it was clear that the in-development T-virus was the cause of the murder. Initially, Umbrella instructed me secretively to keep Stars out of the case. But, with the heightened emotions of the citizens, Stars had no choice but to move in. That's when my next order was given. Dispatch stars to the mansion, dispose of them, then report the situation to headquarters so that their combat with the bow could be used for data analysis, allowing Umbrella a comprehensive portrait of the bow's combat abilities. From the two stars teams, I first pitched in the Bravo team. As expected, the top elite of stars gave all they had and became useful sample data. Then following, 
I geared up the Alpha team to search and rescue the lost Bravo team. The members of the Alpha team also proved their worth, and as expected, many died. There were five survivors from the initial 11 STARS members. From the Alpha team were Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, and Barry Burton. And from the Bravo team were Rebecca Chambers and Enrico Marini. Like a gem for the fans that we've had the same talented actor portray this character that we take very seriously. And I feel, without taking it too seriously, the integrity of the character is affected when Capcom cut and change. I do like to see the consistency that you get with maybe more so with Japanese voice artists that stay with the characters through the years. So for me, having you on is such a treat, but also I think it's fantastic that with that insight that you have of the character and, and, and referencing things like Shere Khan, that we got to enjoy your performance not just once, but with Wesker's report and again with Resident Evil Zero. Oh, don't forget about Resident Evil 4. <laughs> well... Uh, I'm blushing. Thank you. I made Albert Wesker blush. You did. Job done. <laughs> My eyes are red. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the red eyes in Code Veronica. That's right. I injected the virus I obtained from Birkin in advance. If I made Umbrella believe I was dead, it made it far more convenient to sell myself to the opposing corporation. According to Birkin, the virus had profound effects. It would put my body in a state of temporary death. It would then bring me back to life with superhuman powers. Therefore, I unleashed an awesome tyrant from its slumber and let it attack me. Leela, this question comes from Yoke. I re-listened to your last interview with Crimson Head Elder, and your voice is a prime example for what I imagine royalty would sound like. <laughs> it's, it's so elegant. Is your voice always like this? <laughs> oh, it's so, so sweet. You know, I have to say this really touches me personally because my, my, my dialect is, um, lives in a, in a little bit of a, a mid-Atlantic way. I used to actually have a British dialect as a kid growing up and getting older. I, you know, I'm Canadian, but I lived in England. So it was always this hybrid. But I um, I actually used to get uh, made fun of because of my voice and my dialect. So, you know, I, you know I, I hear something like this and it just touches an old wound from childhood of being made fun of for sounding unusual. So, Yoke, I really appreciate you saying this. Thank you. Well, his question resonates with me because I can definitely hear that. I heard that in your performance, particularly late, later on in the game when there's that real strength to your delivery. So I don't know if the English comes out when you get angry. It does, actually. It comes out when I get angry or I have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> you had a powerful role and your voice fitted her perfectly. Wow. Again, very, very kind to hear this. Touches an old childhood wound of being made fun of for sounding the way I do. So thank you. Bloody I ask you, Allison. While well, I am immensely disappointed with the way the casting ultimately went with the Resident Evil 2 remake, do you see this as being the last time you attempted to return as Claire? Is there any possibility of you ever returning to the role of Claire in an official capacity? I've always said I, I go where the fans want me to go and where the, the employers want to employ me. So I, I don't have a bad relationship with Capcom. They are in charge of their properties and they make their own decisions. I've been fortunate enough to benefit from the immense fan support that is out there mm. for Claire Redfield and for the work that I've done. It's business, right? People in position always want to make money. It makes sense to, to have me involved because fans are going to support, then I think they would probably approach that. What about you, Richard? What do you think in terms of ever revoicing Wesker? Well, if I'm asked, I absolutely would. As sort of you said, I mean, I will go, I will go to where the employment is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's probably the same a little bit with UK actors, but with Canadian actors in particular, you have to do everything. 
I believe, of course I'm biased, I believe it makes us more well-rounded because we do voice work, we do animation, we do stage, we do, you know, whatever is out there. Because we have a small market, you've got to be very versatile in order to, you know, pay the rent and the mortgage and et cetera, et cetera. So I, it's absolutely in Capcom's hands. And I am a fan of Capcom. I play their games. Are you a fan of the Resident Evil game actually as a gamer, that style? This is an odd thing to say, but I'm not really into horror games. I prefer the uh, fantasy open world stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, Dark Arisen, things like that. I am constantly overwhelmed at the impact that this little thing, and it was a little thing at the time to me. I went into a studio a couple times and said 30 lines in total or something. And then to have people, that's the thing that they mean, oh, my God, you were Wesker. Oh my God! Are you the guy who played Albert Wesker in you know Wesker's Report, Code Veronica, whatever the whatever it is that's on their mind? I'm always sort of blown away that this has had the uh, the staying power that it has had. So I would I would revisit it in a hearty, happily. I might even do it for free, but I doubt it. <laughs> Report: Time is almost up. Klaus is dead. Really? Hmm. Leon doesn't die easily. That's fine. We can use him to clean up Sadler for us. We'll let them fight it out. Neither one of them will manage to come out unharmed. Easier said than done. Either way, it's your job to clean up what's left of them when the fight is over. Don't forget who is running the show. Whatever happens, we can't let either of them live to see tomorrow. Our goal is to retrieve the sample. Take out anything that might interfere with our plans. That's interesting you mentioned the open world RPG games. Interested to know but your opinion on whether you think the Resident Evil narrative would work in that more open world type of game. Almost, you know, like a, like you said, Dragon's Dogma, like a, a Skyrim version of Resident Evil set across... I would ra- love set- to see something like that. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Set across Raccoon City. Yeah, that would be really fun. And if you could have it in Raccoon City would be a good idea because then you can make it deeper than wide. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like a more sort of Dragon Age 2, where it's all in one city, so there's a depth of story, as opposed to a Skyrim where your data is taken up by the world. (laughs) Yes. You know what I mean? (laughs) That's where you can spend your data, yeah. I'm always surprised when someone complains that a game is too long. And I saw that a a couple times on Code Veronica. I thought, I mean, you want to get your money's worth, don't you? (laughs) Don't you want to just keep playing and playing? You do feel that size, and from an exploratory point of view, that that's fantastic as a gamer. The one criticism I hear of Code Veronica is the backtracking, but I mean that that's for me that's one of the highlights of the game. Well, I think Richard touched on that earlier. A very good point to make, uh, and a very keen observation, both in Resident Evil Two and then in Code Veronica. Yes, there's backtracking, and you you're retracing steps because, as Richard points out, you're putting your engine data and what's taking up space for this game into the storytelling and the actual action adventure that's going on as opposed to having it just be an extension of the world every single time you go to do something. So I think it's a smart choice. I think there's a lot to be discovered there and there's lots you can do within one little surrounding. I have no problem with backtracking and I think people need to understand that what this game is. If you are looking for world exploration, then you go and play one of those games. But that's not what this game is. It's a scary story. (laughs) Yes, it is. And we are are set, and our goal is to make you poop your pants. (laughs) (laughs) Vicariously live through Claire's shoes, don't we, and feeling that, and then hearing that resonate through Richard's delivery. Yeah. And I'm interested to hear Richard say that you're not a huge fan of horror games or, or that genre because I, I wasn't at all when I first came to play Resident Evil. I think what just resonated with me was more the atmosphere and the emotion of the game. I was never a particular fan of zombie films. You know, for me, it's all in the emotion, the survival horror and the narrative and the story and the, and the tragedy. And, you know, there's a lot of tragedy in Code Veronica. Yeah, and I think they did a, a excellent job with not just the visuals, but the sound engineering of atmosphere. You can reference things like the Dark Souls franchise, where they seem to get atmosphere just right. You know, I do give kudos for that. Yeah, I can't play Dark Souls. It just—it's so frustrating. (laughs) I gave up. (laughs) 
nice atmosphere until I gave up and went, this is too hard. Yeah, and Code Veronica as well, for me, has one of the best soundtracks. Various rooms and locations have their, like, you know, their signature track. You've got the save room theme, which for me is very, yeah. very melancholy. Uh, I use that word quite a lot when I'm talking about certain Resident Evil tracks, but in kind of, you know, a haunting way, some fantastic tracks that really set the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. Alton, do you remember recording the line, do you want me to take care of this for you, little boy? The way you said it to Steve, it sounded like you're like, you're scolding a little child or something. Yeah, there are aspects of that in there. When she first meets him, that's definitely what she thinks of him. He's trying to be all muscly and like put a gun to her head and tell her what to do. And she drops him in 30 seconds, <laughs> you know. So pretty much off the top, that's her attitude. But because she is a good person and she has compassion, she gets to know him and obviously starts to care about his well-being. And what I love about that relationship is that level of development, character development in a video game. It's stereotypical male and female playing off each other. Is there going to be a romantic tension or not? It's slightly different. Different fans take from it different things. There are the fans that want Claire and Steve to be together. And then there's that more maybe matriarchal response to Steve. Those aren't the only choices. I would actually go with, again, sibling, but it was it's a role reversal because... This is her chance to almost be like a big sister. There's the love and the tenderness and caring, but I'm so sorry to disappoint fans because, again, it's not just about my interpretation. So people are welcome to see it however it comes across to them. Mm. And who knows if my approach is ultimately what was intended by the writer. Certainly with Steve, it was very much that dynamic of, it's okay, little brother, I got this and I'll help you through this. So in the end, I think when I watch those scenes with Steve and Claire, it's an opportunity for Claire to be the older, wiser, comforting sibling. You get to see that strength come through. But then, you know, as soon as Chris shows up, suddenly Claire is the, the weak, vulnerable sibling again. Wait! I wasn't trying to escape. I just... the alarm sounded and the door unlocked. I thought... That I... Rockford uh, Prison, uh, Detainee 267. <laughs> Guess you're not with Umbrella, then, are you? I'm Claire Redfield. You scared me. Eyes forward. Uh, so, what's your name? My name's Steve. <laughs> you don't look like one of them, Claire. They get you, too? Yeah. You could say that. The time when I was recording, we were actually in the booth together. Oh, and that's quite unusual, isn't it? I guess because I had done Resident Evil 2, the Capcom guys felt that it would be good for me to be in scenes with the other actors because most of the actors I was working with in Code Veronica hadn't been part of the Resident Evil franchise. We had some really strong actors coming on board who were more from a theater world, so it was definitely just to make sure that we all kind of brought the same energy and intensity to the scenes, just so that the dynamic would match up. That was really great. I appreciated being able to record with the other actors. Next question. Trooper2004 asks you, Allison, do you follow the story of Claire in other medias as books, comics, and live-action movies, and what is your opinion about it? I've watched the live-action movies. I like Ali Larder. Things are allowed to be different for different mediums. It makes sense that they can have a different approach because not everything translates over in the best possible way. And then as for stories and whatnot in fan fiction, I don't. And it's only because there aren't enough hours in the day. <laughs> and it, it is a big rabbit hole that I know if I started, I would get lost down. But I think that's a good thing that, you know, she's represented across all different media. I think it's fantastic, and um, it's also because, to touch on what you were just saying, the fans are so, <laughs> they have so much conviction which storylines they want to believe that it actually was very difficult for me to just answer that question about the relationship between Claire and Steve. Listening to you, Alison, it's incredible to talk to an artist like yourself one associated with Claire Redford for so long. Absolutely incredible to listen to you connect with the game and your interpretation of the characters, which was far better than my one. And it's just, it's just a treat to listen to. 
Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for that. She's been a really cool character to develop and portray. Looks like my brother was never even here. Umbrella probably doesn't know where he is either. What did he do? Why are they after him? I don't know. But he's been missing for three months. I was in Paris looking for him. I broke into one of Umbrella's labs. But I got caught. And you were sent here. What about you? What's your story? Uh, it's dumb. You don't want to know. <laughs> Just tell me. <laughs> I didn't even do anything. Some other jackass screwed up. Landed the two of us in here. So we're in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. So you don't know much about this place, do you? Apparently some noble family owned the joint. The Ashfords. That's Alfred. He's the only surviving member. Rumor has it, he went mad from loneliness. But why would anyone want to bomb this place? Anyway, I've got to contact Leon. He'll come for us. Can I do one shout out to a UK fan? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Her name is Ely in Scotland, and all I'm going to say is, hello, Ely. <laughs> wow, the sort of shivers down my spine there when you said that, and I don't even know who Ely is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a shout out to Hank Foreman, who again has contributed questions, which I really appreciate. And also my buddy Caesar. he's in Mexico, so I just wanted to also extend love to anyone in Mexico who is listening right now. So sorry for everything that's been going on with the earthquakes. Man, I love you guys. You're strong. And I really hope I get down there soon to meet you guys in person. And I would do a shout out to Puerto Rico, but they don't have power. So for um, yeah. when this message ever gets out, love and strength to you guys. I'm sorry you don't have a president right now, but the rest of the world cares. So to the mayor of San Juan and all of the people down there actually doing their best to help, bless you all, love and strength to you all, and the rest of the world is going to try to find a way to help too. Well said. Yeah, so all I can say is thank you to you and the rest of the fan base out there. Questions are really appreciated, and I thought that this was a really fun podcast to do. Thank you so much for coming on here. It was a pleasure. My pleasure, truly my pleasure, and and so nice speaking with all of you, and um, hope we can do this again. Lilo, it's been such a pleasure. Wonderful again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Wonderful. I uh, really appreciated this. Apologies for figuratively photobombing your interview. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm afraid now I have to leave. Thank you for this. This Thank was a, a ton of fun. Thank you. Please come back. I'm starting the bidding at $150. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank you so much to Alison for arranging this and, and Richard for so graciously coming on in your free time, not having even spoken to me or Aaron before. That, that was really kind. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Richard, you were the best. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Okay. Thank Bye. you for coming. See ya. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Wow. Alison, thank you. <laughs> Jesus. Thank you. Um, Alison, that's incredible. I can't believe I cut him off the first time. I, I know. It's hilarious. So we had it all set up, and I'm like, I'm just going to add you. Don't say anything yet. <laughs> and then when you hear the right opportunity, say something. But then when he first called and the video came on, I'm like, shit, they can see you. I saw someone trying to send a video. I thought it would be like some spam porn or something. And I just thought, Christ, of all the – got Leela Johnson and Alison Court, and, and I'm getting this <laughs> thing from – the, the, this I thought somebody kick. hacked us. You know, I, know. <laughs> I was laughing so hard. I had to have my mic on mute. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you for coming. And thank you for the surprise. My <laughs> pleasure. I'm so, I, oh. I wish we got your little, your squeak reaction. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might be on my, my recording. I don't know. Okay. Thank fantastic. you. Have a great day, guys. And you. Bye. Bye. Oracle, you still there? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was now, 
anyone or anything that stood in my way would be terminated. It has been that way for a long time, and it always will be. At all costs, I had to make stars pay. Stay away! Or is it outside the mansion! Stay! Away. The BSAA received intel as to the whereabouts of Umbrella's founder. I'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters! Place of Umbrella's demise. <laughs>